Hello everyone and welcome to episode 7 of my beginner's guide to Kerbal Space Program. In the last episode we talked about maneuvers and we talked about Delta V and we realized how we could affect our orbit so that the altitude of our orbit could reach out towards the moon. In this episode what we're going to do is start the process of building something and then flying something that's going to get ourselves to the moon and get ourselves back. Now this is going to be a three-part little mini-series and in this episode what we're going to be doing is concentrating just on the spacecraft itself, what I'm going to keep referring to as the orbiter. The job of which is to do everything we need to do once we've achieved our low Kerbin orbit and to return our Kerbal back to the surface of Kerbin safely. Next episode, we're going to talk about getting that thing up into orbit. We're going to build a booster for it and talk a little bit more about booster design. And then the episode of that is when we're going to actually do the actual mission. So let's concentrate on what we're going to talk about in this episode. Well, in order to get ourselves to the moon, we need to sort of decide, well, how much delta V do I need? Remember what delta V means. In order to do anything in space, what you need to do is change the velocity of your spacecraft and delta V represents how much do you need to change your velocity by in order to perform any particular maneuver. So we're gonna construct ourselves a delta V budget so we know exactly how to design our spacecraft. Then we're gonna get into the actual building of all this and in that process we've got actually a number of different engines that we can choose from. So we're gonna compare the thrusts and a new value, the ISP of those engines so that we pick the right engine for the job. And we're also gonna talk a little bit more about thrust to weight ratio, specifically what thrust to weight ratios do you require when it comes to orbital maneuvering. But enough of all this, let's get ourselves started. All right, and we're gonna be building ourselves a new rocket. And not to break a pattern, this one is going to be our fifth rocket. <laughs> And as I mentioned in the intro, what we're designing today is just going to be the spacecraft itself. This spacecraft is going to start itself in low Kerbin orbit and then it's going to perform all the tasks that we want it to perform. And in order to do that, we need to work out how much delta V does this vessel require. Remember that delta V is the amount that you can change the velocity of your vessel and changing your velocity is how you accomplish what it is you want to do. All right, how do we know what kind of delta V we're going to require in order to do what we want? Well, one thing you can do is you can actually calculate it yourself. And I do have videos, a whole series of videos on how to do that if you're interested in calculating it yourself. But if you're like most people, you just wanna know what the numbers are. So there are people that have gone through and done these calculations for us and built what are called Delta V maps. And what I'm showing here is what's probably the most common one. This is the one that is published on the KSP Wiki. I will put a link to it down there in the description if you want to have it by yourself. And it gives you common Delta Vs to get yourself to, well, a whole variety of different places. But what we're interested in is going to the moon. So let's start here, down here at the bottom, where we find Kerbin. Now this circle represents the surface of Kerbin. We don't really care about that right now. We're gonna pretend that we're going to already get ourselves into space, get ourselves into a low orbit, and then figure out what that vessel requires in order to get done what we can. So we're gonna skip past the surface of Kerbin and move up here to this oval, which represents a low orbit about Kerbin. Notice the 80 kilometers that is there. This is an 80 kilometer low orbit. And all the numbers that flow out of this are all based upon that fact. Though to be quite honest, if you're in slightly different orbits than this, it really doesn't affect things too much. Now, we want to go to the moon, and the moon is this gray path that goes up here towards the left. The next step in our journey is going to be to get an encounter with the moon and that takes 860 meters per second. So we wanna keep track of that number. That's gonna get our orbit up to the moon's orbit so that we can hopefully encounter the moon. 
Then, in order to get our capture about the moon and get a low orbit, it's going to cost us 310 meters per second. So we've got to add that onto our budget. So now you can imagine we're going to be in a low orbit. The next number there is going to be to land on the moon. I'm going to save that for a future episode, so we're going to ignore it. So we're now in low orbit. Now what we want to do is get our Kerbal back. Okay, well, actually, you can read this whole map backwards. So in order to break away from low Kerbin orbit and get ourselves, or low moon orbit, and to get ourselves back on a trajectory towards Kerbin, it's going to cost, again, 310 meters per second. Then you might think, oh, well, we got to now add on the 860. No, we're going to subtract off that 860 by simply going through the atmosphere and letting the atmosphere slow us down. So in fact, for our entire budget, that is it. And if we add up those three numbers, the 860 to get out there, the 310 to get in orbit, and then the 310 to break moon or orbit, we have a total of 1,480 meters per second. It's always a good idea to budget a little bit more than that. Last thing you want is something to go untowards and find yourself with no fuel and then you are stuck. But we're gonna work with this 1,480, yeah, maybe about 1,550 to 1,600 meters per second just to add a little bit more. All right, let's get ourselves started. That was enough of that. So we're gonna start once again with the Mark I command capsule. All this you have seen before. We're also gotta think about science. We have still the same science parts we've had so far. I've yet to unlock anything more, but some, I have unlocked some new stuff under the electrical. So far this has been my only battery. I now have these batteries, the Z200, which hold twice as much as the Z100, and also it's a nice inline part. So we're going to put battery there, and in fact I'm going to copy that one and put another one right, oh it gets, gets a little twitchy, can I do it? There, that's what I want, right under there, okay? Um, I also have here some solar panels. This is great. So while we're in the sun, we'll be able to generate electricity as and not be just dependent on what we take with us and what is the electricity that we generate from our engine. So that is going to be nice. Another thing I want to put in here before I start putting into the science are if I go to command and control, I have the small inline reaction wheels talked about reaction wheels a little bit before this is a means of attitude control we use electricity to change the orientation of our ship there are already reaction wheels built into the command capsule right here you can see reaction wheels and it provides five kilonewton meters of torque you don't have to worry about the units and that allows us to steer our ship. But our ship is going to start getting bigger, start getting heavier. Although this probably will be okay. It's not going to hurt to put in some more. So for a little bit extra, this is going to double the amount of torque. And it also gives us a nice thing on which to attach things. All right. Now let's get into science. We have ourselves a mystery goo. We're going to collect mystery goo in space around the moon and just like with Kerbin there is low space there is high space there is low space about the moon and there is high space about the moon so what we're going to do is we're going to I'm going to turn it this way and we're going to put on two times symmetry um, and then we're going to do it here so that's looking pretty good and we'll close these off there we go that takes care of our science stuff now what we need to do is start to propel ourselves and keep that budget in mind that uh, 1,480 meters per second. So we're gonna take a, let's take our largest fuel can that we have, which is right now the FL-T400 fuel can is the largest one in which I have unlocked. And we'll put it down there on the bottom for our liquid fuel engine. You can, by the way, get into putting solid fuels in for your orbiters, it does work. But the problem is, remember with solid fuel rocket motors, that you can't turn them on and off. Once you turn, well, you can turn them on and then they only go off when they run out of fuel. Not the best deal for an orbiter. So we're gonna stick with liquid fuel and oxygen. And I have a new engine here, the LV-909 Terrier engine. So we have some choices of liquid fuel engines. We have the LV-909 Terrier, the Swivel, and the Reliant. The Reliant of the three of these has the most thrust in a vacuum. It's 240 kilonewtons of thrust. And the Terrier has the least. It's 60 kilonewtons of thrust. But I want to draw attention to one other very important number, and that is the vessel's ISP. If we go over here towards the right, we have engine ISP. 
Again, if you want to get into all the math of this, I have videos for that. I'll put a link up there in the Duber Dube and you can follow that right along. But what it measures is the efficiency of this engine. This engine has an ISP of 85 uh, seconds is actually the units, but we'll just call it 85. And this is at sea level, the ASL. But then it's 345 in a vacuum. So this engine performs very well in a vacuum, but not well at all in uh, the atmosphere. If we take a look at, for instance, the Reliant, notice that it has a lower ISP in a vacuum, 310, but a much higher atmosphere or ISP at a at sea level. That's because the Reliant is designed as an engine to operate in both atmosphere and in a vacuum. In other words, it's an engine designed for your lifter, for your booster, to get yourself out of the atmosphere and into a vacuum. This engine is designed specifically to work in a vacuum and it's not designed to work in an atmosphere. So pick the right engine for the job. This thing is going to be our orbiter. It's going to be the thing that's going to operate purely in space, purely in a vacuum. So this is the engine for our orbiter. So we're going to plunk that down there at the bottom. Okay, let's take a look at some of the stats. Right now you're saying, oh my gosh, 459 meters per second. We need to get 1480. Uh, be careful here if we go to our delta V tab. Notice that I wish the default was actually a vacuum, but the default seems to be sea level. I want to change that to vacuum. Ah, that's more like it. 1865 meters per second. That's the kind of thing I want to see. We're going to open up the tab here and we're going to also see that we have a thrust to weight ratio of 1.3. I've talked a little bit about thrust to weight ratios when it came to getting ourselves up and out of the atmosphere. What about if you're just purely in space? Well, it turns out that thrust to weight ratio is not as big a deal once you are in space. You can get away with very small thrust to weight ratios. Thrust to weight ratio is quite a bit less than one. It makes your burn take longer to perform. So if you're an impatient type, you might want to have a higher thrust to weight ratio. But as far as getting yourselves from A to B, you have much more time once you are in space than you are during that whole lift off and orbital insertion phase. So a low thrust to weight ratio is fine. In fact, 1.3, I'm going to leave it. I think that is just great. It can be a lot lower than that. Okay. And in fact, what I think I'm going to do is I might actually even, because the ISP is so high, I might actually even take out some of this fuel. That's 1718. Oops. Always when you're taking out liquid fuel and oxidizer, make sure you do it in a balanced way. That's 1405. That's too low. That is 1565, yeah, let's remember 1480 is our budget. Let's go a little bit higher. We saved ourselves a little bit of mass now. We have tons of Delta V, so there we go. All right, I'm gonna tweak her up, make it look a little, I don't know what's, that looks good. Okay, we are closing in on a final design. Uh, what I've yet to put, solar panels couple things to show you but number one is solar panels so these are the oxstat photovoltaic panels and what I'm gonna do these are static panels they just sit on the side and when the sun's shining on them they generate electricity you do have to think about the Sun like if they are behind the spacecraft in the you know on the shadow side of the spacecraft they're not gonna work at all and if they're at an angle to the Sun they don't work as well so to sort of what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put this on eight times symmetry, make eight of these, position them so they sort of look nice. There, that looks okay. And in fact, we'll even, I don't like the way they're sort of sticking out a little bit. So we're going to click on that. I'm going to put this on local. We're just going to tuck them in just a little bit like, like so. There we go. So they're little, little things are a little bit more streamlined there. That looks good. Okay, and that added a little bit of mass, but you can see here our delta V is still more than adequate, so everything is fine. Now, there's one last thing I want to show you, and to be honest, I've been meaning to show you this for a few episodes now, but I keep getting tight for time. 
So this is a good time for me to show it to you. And that has to do with a button way up here called Actions. I've yet to use this one. Click on that, we get this new menu here. You see here we got what's called Action Groups. These are events that you can trigger and control what it is that you want to do. So for instance, staging, of course, just staging. Um, gear, we don't have landing gear on this thing. Lights, lights is something that we can show you what they do. When we turn on the lights, we have the Mark I command pod, and it says there we're going to toggle the lights. And in fact, here I have the Illuminator Mark II, and I actually cut this part out just for the interest of time, but I actually stuck a couple of newly unlocked lights there. And if I turn them on, it'll hopefully light up this service bay kind of nice but what I have done is put them on here so that if I hit the light button if I turn on the lights these lights will turn on as well okay so let's talk a little bit more about action groups and especially these custom ones down here there's one two three four all the way up to ten these correspond to the uh, numbers on your keypad and you can push them to trigger certain events so one of the things I've been doing in my episodes where I've been collecting science is pinning those science menus up to the side and that can get pretty cluttered and it's easy to kind of miss them instead what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna attach those events to action groups so the first time I'm gonna want to collect science is when I get into the moon moon's sphere of influence and I will be in high space about the moon. So let's think about all the science I would like to collect at that time. So I'm going to click on custom group 1 and let's see I'm going to want to do a materials bay so I'm going to collect on the materials bay and up here are all the things that you can do about with the materials bay and what do I want to do well I would like to observe the materials bay so we're going to click on that one. And so now while I'm in the mission if I click 1 on the keypad the materials bay will be observed that means I don't have to bring up its menu and all that kind of thing I would also at the same time like to do a mystery goo so we're gonna click on toggle observe the mystery goo we're gonna do a temperature scan so log the temperature and we're gonna do a pressure scan so we're gonna log the pressure and we're gonna do a crew report here are all the things we can do with the command capsules but in there there it is crew report we want to do a crew report so now instead of clicking on those things individually I can just hit one on the keyboard and it's gonna do all those notice the one thing it's missing actually is the Kerbal EVAs collecting science from Kerbal EVAs uh, you can't attach an action group to a Kerbal but you can anything that's associated with the ship okay so that takes care of high space let's go to number two and here we'll take care of low space so again I want to do a crew report I want to do the other mystery goo that one's going to get used up so we're going to do the other mystery goo observe materials bay and there we go there's going to be when we get into low science all the stuff we're going to want to do and then finally I'm going to make one more I'm going to go to action group number 10 which is zero on the keypad and I'm going to click on my service bay and here I'm going to hit toggle and what that toggle does is it toggles the door so now every time I hit zero these doors will either open or close depending upon what the situation was that way again there's another part I don't have to right click so what you can do is take all of your parts that require actions to happen to them and attach those actions to action groups so that while you're flying you can just hit numbers on your keypad rather than use the context menus all the time Alright, I think this finishes this off. This is looking pretty good. So in the next episode, we're going to talk about building something to get this thing into orbit. It's all great and fine right now, but it needs to get into space first. But why don't we right now just summarize what we talked about in this episode. We started by talking about making a Delta V budget and looking at Delta V maps in order to plan out how much Delta V you're going to require. This will be, it's essential really for you to be able to design your spacecraft with reasonable efficiency. We then got into designing the spacecraft and specifically we talked about the engines and how you want to pick the right engine for the job and one of the things you definitely want to take a look at is the ISP of the engine which remembers measures the efficiency of the engine and realize that that efficiency can be dramatically different depending upon whether you're in the atmosphere or whether you are in the vacuum of space. 
we took another brief look at thrust to weight ratio, specifically realizing that once you are in orbit, thrust to weight ratio isn't nearly as important as it is when you're trying to get off of the surface. And in fact, you can get away with much smaller thrust to weight ratios once you are in space. And then we concluded with taking a look at action groups and how to attach actions to action groups so that you don't have to always be clicking on those context menus. But with that, well, this vessel is all ready to go into space. All it needs is a booster. But of course, that's going to be for next episode. And until then, I thank you for watching and hope to see you then.